Hello, I'm Ken with Orion Telescopes and Binoculars, and in this video I'm going to be talking about the best ways to view the planets. Uh, just some tips and techniques uh, to give you the best possible view so you don't get a fuzzy, out of focus, blurry image of the planets. So you get a nice, sharp, crisp image uh, at higher magnifications. Uh, these tips will work with any telescope. Uh, right here I just, for example, have a four and a half inch reflector, uh, but these tips work for the smallest little 60 millimeter refractor all the way up to the largest reflector you can haul out with you when you go out uh, camping. All right, well, let's get started and talk about the planets. Uh, the first step is making sure that your telescope is ready to view the planets. Um, if you have a refractor, you don't have to worry about this, but if you've got a reflector like this one, you've got to make sure that the telescope is properly collimated. All of our reflectors uh, include a manual, and in the back of the manual it tells you exactly how to do the alignment. The, the alignment of the mirrors is critical because if it's not getting the light perfectly square to the eyepiece of the telescope here, it's going to distort the view and you won't get as good quality of an image as you possibly could. It may not be so bad at lower powers, but when you start to push the telescope to its highest resolution limit, if it's at all out of collimation, you're not going to get a very good image. So make sure it's well aligned. Uh, and like I said, if you have a refractor, you don't have to worry about that. That's the one nice thing about refractors, maintenance free in terms of aligning the, uh, the system. Uh, the other thing is to pick a good location. Um, if you are in a spot in the middle of a, uh, if it's a hot day, like it's been 90 degrees outside and it's just getting dark, and you're in a parking lot with asphalt, there's going to be a lot of heat coming up from the asphalt, and it probably will stay warm for several hours as it cools down. That's not going to be the best view because it's like in the desert, off in the distance, you see that mirage. That's the heat shimmering, and it's distorting the atmosphere and keeping you from getting the sharpest image. So best would be... Um, a grassy field, uh, the backyard, just anywhere where there's not a lot of heat on the ground. If you can put your hand on the deck or the, the concrete and you feel that it's warm, you're probably not going to get the best views. Uh, when you are picking a location, also make sure you don't look over uh, houses. So I know that might be difficult if you're in your backyard, so you got to make do. But if you're right next to a neighbor's house and he's got his heater going inside or the fireplace going, and there's a plume of hot air coming up off of his roof, that's going to sort the view too. So if you're looking at a planet that's directly over his chimney, you're going to get a terrible view and you won't be able to go to high power. So try to stay away from buildings <coughs> uh, or other heat sources. Uh, the jacuzzi is another one. If you've got a jacuzzi in the backyard and it's pumping out heat, you won't get a very good image in that area of the sky. So away from buildings, uh, away from concrete or hot sources. And uh, also you want to do the same thing with your telescope. If you take it outside, um, it's going to be the same temperature as inside. It'll be 70 degrees, uh, the mirror might be 70 degrees of the lens, and it's 40 degrees outside. It's going to take a little bit of time for your lens or mirror to cool down. So as it cools, the mirror or the lens changes shape just slightly, and that's going to distort the image as well. So with a little reflector like this, it doesn't matter so much, maybe 20 minutes and you're ready to view the best images. But if you've got a larger 8, 10, or 12 inch reflector, it can take 30 minutes, 45 minutes, maybe up to an hour if it's a big heat differential between how warm the telescope is being stored inside and the ambient temperature outside. So make sure you uh, acclimatize the telescope. What I like to do is take the telescope outside before dinner, uh, go in, eat, and then I'll know by the time I get outside it's acclimatized, it's the same temperature, and we'll be ready to go for observing. The first thing you're going to want to do before pointing the telescope at the planets is align the finder scope. It might seem like a simple thing, uh, but it's very critical. If the finder's not aligned, you're not going to be able to find anything in the sky. The field of view is very narrow uh, through the telescope, so aligning the finder is critical. Point the scope off at something during the day, um, get a tree, the top of a tree or the corner of a building centered in the eyepiece, then look through the finder and adjust the little screws or adjustment screws until the, the dot or the crosshair is right on the object that you're looking at. Then you're ready to observe the sky and it'll be easy to find things. So when you're looking at the planets, you want to make sure that you're not viewing them when they're too low in the sky. When you're looking straight overhead, you're looking through probably less than 50 miles of atmosphere. So that's the best spot in the sky because there's not as much between you and the object you're looking at. But if the planet is, say, 20 degrees off the horizon, let's say it's just risen and it's only 20 degrees up, you're looking through hundreds of miles of atmosphere versus just 50 miles straight up and uh, the atmosphere acts kind of like a swimming pool and you're at the bottom of it. When you're looking up at stuff outside the swimming pool, it's all distorted, right? Because the atmosphere is turbulent and there's air moving around. So when you're looking through hundreds of miles of that turbulent atmosphere, the image gets very blurry and, and very difficult to focus and you lose all the detail. So make sure you're viewing when the object is as high as possible. 
Uh, the general rule of thumb is just don't look at anything under 30 degrees uh, altitude. And if you can get it when it's 45 degrees or higher, that's, that's best. You'll get the, the best views then. A really good way to determine when the planets will be highest or best, uh, best viewing locations is to use some of the astronomy software applications. Uh, we've got them for uh, laptop computers or desktops. We also have them for smartphones as well. So you tell it your location. Uh, if it's the case of a smartphone, it'll already know based on the GPS and the phone. Uh, but you tell it your location. You bring up Saturn, say, if you're looking for, for Saturn. And then it'll tell you when it rises, when it sets. What, uh, what time the highest uh, point, the transit point uh, for the planet is. So you can fine tune your observing location and times based on when the software is going to tell you that uh, it's best to view the planets. The next step to viewing planets is to get the right magnification. Now, you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to just jump right to the highest magnification possible because the, the atmospheric conditions change. And one night you might be out there and you find you can't do anything more than 100 power. Well, that might be because the, the jet stream is going right overhead and the atmosphere is very turbulent and things just look really blurry past 100 power. But then maybe the next night or, or even just minutes to hours later, the conditions might change and all of a sudden everything's very still. You notice the stars uh, stop twinkling and now you can view at 200, 250 power uh, without losing that detail. So you gotta uh, sort of experiment uh, the night that you're out, start with low power and start working your way up from low power to high power until you see, hey, you know, the, the planet got bigger, but I actually see less detail. There's the cutoff point. You've gone too far at that magnification. Uh, planets, they come into their own at about 100 power and from there on up uh, work uh, very well. You see a lot of detail. Saturn's rings at 100 power are very easily visible. Um, the moons of Jupiter are visible at very low powers. Uh, even 10 power binoculars see that. But if you want to see the cloud bands on the surface of Jupiter, 50, 75, 100 power, somewhere in there is great. The way you figure out the maximum power that you don't really want to go past on the telescope is just to keep in mind the rule of thumb, two power per millimeter of aperture. So this is a 4.5 inch telescope that's um, 114 millimeters. Uh, so two power, uh, two times 114, so that's 200, 220 something power. You don't want to go past that. You've exceeded the resolution limit of the telescope. So always make sure you're, you're below that. A bigger telescope, say a, a six inch telescope, it's got more aperture, uh, that's 150 millimeters. So that means um, 300 power is the max there. You might think that that means if you have a, a, a 10 inch telescope, you can go to uh, 500 power. Well, theoretically, yes, if there was no atmosphere in the way. But the atmosphere, like I said, is acting like that surface of the swimming pool and it's distorting everything. So no matter what size telescope you've got, if it can get up to 300 power, that's usually the limit. The atmosphere after 300 power kind of cuts you off and you can't really see more detail. There might be rare exceptions one night a year when the atmosphere is perfectly steady and you'll find that your 10-inch telescope can do 400 power and you see more detail than you did at 300. But those nights don't come by very often. So go to the two power per aperture limit or 300 magnification, whichever one is, is lower. That's, that's where you want to kind of stay. So don't go above 300 power. Um, you can figure out the magnification of your system by taking the focal length of the telescope. So this one this is a four and a half inch telescope. It's got a 450 millimeter focal length. Divide the eyepiece uh, into that. So 450 divided by six millimeter, that's 75 power. So this eyepiece is giving you 75 power. Good to start looking at the planets but you can definitely do more. If you add a, um, a Barlow lens uh, underneath this, it doubles the power. So it takes it from 75 to 150 millimeters. Uh, same thing as if you were to put a smaller eyepiece on here. So this is a six. If you were to put a four, or it would be a three millimeter to give you 150 power. That's the way to figure out the magnification. If you want to just go to the, the limit of what the scope can do, um, the, the rule of the, the math um, formula is just to reverse it. So 450 millimeters divided by the power that you want. So let's say 450 uh, divided by 150 power. That'll give you the focal length that you want. So 450 divided by 150 power, that's a six millimeter, uh, no, that's a three millimeter eyepiece. So that would be the six plus a Barlow or just a three millimeter eyepiece on its own. So that's how you figure out the magnification. Remember, don't go too much. Go just to enough magnification to give you a nice sharp image without overly magnifying it and making it blurry. And then lastly for viewing planets you can add uh, some accessories to enhance the view a bit. Uh, color filters are popular for 
bringing out some of the contrast and seeing a little bit more detail than you did before when you're looking at the surface of, say, Jupiter or Saturn. Um, we have a four color filter set that includes uh, red, yellow, green, and blue. They're, they're organized by their RAT numbers. So the ADA blue filter, um, there's a 25 red, and then a yellow and a green filter. Um, each of them do different contrast boosts on the planet. So you can, it's not like one filter works for one planet and then the other one doesn't. Uh, they all enhance different features on the planet. So say the, uh, the ADA blue, that's good for uh, bringing out contrast in the cloud bands on Jupiter. Um, on Mars, it's good for bringing out the polar cap. So you just experiment with them and see what brings out detail that you uh, uh, was a little bit more difficult to see before. It won't show you things that weren't there to begin with. So it's not like things just all of a sudden pop out that were invisible before. It's a subtle boost to the contrast. So it just makes it a bit easier to see some of that subtle detail. Um, so overall, a good way to enhance the view of the planets or the moon. All right, so there you have it. Several tips on observing uh, planets at high magnification in order to give you the best possible view. Just keep those in mind when you're going out. Low power doesn't matter quite so much, some of those tips, but for high power, that's the most critical, uh, difficult thing for a telescope to do cutting through our atmosphere. So keep those tips in mind and you'll get great views in no time. All right, thank you very much. Clear skies.